Young, is this your statement? Young, is this your statement? I was arrested and detained for two years in a forced labor camp simply because I practiced Falun Gong. On the 4th March 2005, around 7.30 p.m., I went to my friend's home, who also practiced Falun Gong, to give her some Falun Gong materials. A few minutes after I entered her, her home, someone knocking at the door. When she opened the door, about seven to eight men burst into the house. They didn't show any of their IDs, and only one of them was wearing a police uniform. The rest were all in pl plain clothes. They separated us into different rooms and started searching her house. They took the Falun Gong books and the materials and took my friend to the police station. One of the men demanded my house keys. When I refused to give it to him, he grabbed my collar with one hand and threatened to slap my face with the, with the other hand. They took me to the police car and I was driven to my home. They searched my home and confiscated my Falun Gong books and the informational materials, computer and the two printers. They finished searching at a quarter to 1 a.m. They arrested me in front of my 16 years old son, who had witnessed everything and took me to the local police station leaving my son there alone. The home turned upside down and his mother gone. I was a single mother. Since then, his character completely changed. The next day, I was taken to the local detention center where I was held for 40 days. One day, a woman came to the cell door. I could see her through the bars and wear a mask. <coughs> She read out a verdict that I had give, been given two years of false labor. There was no trial or legal procedure at all. At the false labor camp, I was isolated in a room and was only allowed to sleep two to four hours a night. I was always hungry as each meal I only got half piece of a steamed sour flour bun. In summer, it was often around 40 degrees, but I wasn't given enough water to drink, and I was not allowed to shower or wash my clothes for two weeks. I was tortured mentally and physically in order to get me to renounce my belief in Falun Gong. They forced me to sit completely still on a stool for a long period of time and watch videos slandering Falun Gong. The sitting rules was, my knees must be closed, my back had to be straight, with hands on my knees, and I was not allowed to close my eyes. My eyes. I had to sit there for between 18 to 20 hours a day. I had to ask permission to move. If I want to drink, I have to say, report to room leader, I want to have some water. And then, if allowed, I had to say, report room leader, I want to pull the cup down. When I asked to go to the toilet, I had to wait about minimum, minimum 30 minutes, sometimes a half day. <coughs> they made my bladder in pain. And later, I didn't have a feeling whether I have urine or not. Sitting on the stool this way, day after day, was very painful. Just a week after, the skin on my bottom was broken. One practitioner's bottom became rotten. I also had to have my body tested every three to five months. This happened to other practitioners as well. 
One day they force a old Falun Gong practitioner to sit on a large coat with the curtains closed. We were forced to put our hands and head on the seat in front. We were then driven to a hospital nearby. The hospital belonged to the re-education system during that time. They forcefully took my blood and put it in the many small tubes. They then checked my weight and blood pressure. I was also given a kidney ultrasound examination, chest x-ray, electrocardiogram, and a urine test. Sometimes we were not allowed to have a breakfast before the body examinations. I was also forced to do some labor for long hours while I was there. This is a just short example of what happened to me. Thank you for listening. Thank you, thank Alice for this testimony. Omar Bekali unfortunately could not attend today. He was not able to receive his passport back in time. He has provided a short video with his experience. We will read the translation. If anyone would like to be in touch with Omar, please just let us know at the end of the event. My name is Omar Bekali. Kimi 4-cü Şunun Terörlük ben onun için bir ay karanızından yattım. Hiç kandak bir kışın bir insan yok. Şimdi bir bak, bazı iki bak tabak verildi. Yani bir tal momosunun kerepçi suyu verildi. Ama şimdi kıyım kısıtlı halette. Onun için günü tutuşmuş başta. Onun için de bu hakkı yatkan insanla. 2017 yıl, 3. yıl, 26. yıl, Hıhtay Saksılı Tepe'de kanun söz kovalı elinip, Mölümür doktorlarına elinip verilip, Eytavur, Üç kavet kişiye götürüldük. Bazı teşhirçilerini birinci kavette, bazı teşhirçilerini ikinci kavette, üçüncü kavette teşhirdi. Deslepte kolum noksudun e, belikimden kan aldı. E, onun için yürek teşhirçi aparatları da yürgünün teşhirçini ötkezdi. E, üçüncü bas kuşta e, böreklerimin teşhirçini ötkezdi. Dörtüncü bas kuşta e, öpkemle düşerdi. Öpkemle teşhirçini ötkezdi. Beşinci bas kuşta suydük, çoğun tayaretlerimin təşhirişini ötkəzdi. Məcburi sularını içtirib, suydurub, təşhirişleti ötkəzdi. Ağırda, bir şimdi 46 elinib, gözümdən qarıçıqları, hətta terdən təşhirişini ötkəzdi. Çünkü vəhim içi də iştahlığa çıxırıqlı taslıq aldım. Çünkü bir işqandak bir bir insanını, bir günahsız bir insanını tört saxçının məcburi doktor üstaları yatkızışı, Hem de bu neslen aparatlarla kurup teşhirişini ötküzüşü de 
Ben onu terk terk organlarla millet kütüde kendim de kendim kattık vahiyemizde kaldım. Kim bu lagır lagır hırgandan kim mi? Pütkül lagırda bir yatıkkan şu an kardeşlerimizden hem ana aşında tepsili umumizlik teşhirüşü etküzü yerli ki hem onu lagır kırgandan kim mi? Her ayda bir kıtım kan elişi kattık bir kokuş içi de sekizli hayatımda dağılmaştırdım ben. Onun benimki ya da yaşlarının 16 yaşında kadar yaşlı insanın izdiyesiz gayet buluşu hep intayın bir insanın vehimini saladı. Thank you. That was very telling. Now please to introduce Sir Geoffrey Nice. Sir Geoffrey Nice has been a barrister since 1971 and served as a part-time judge in England between 1984 and 2018. Between 1998 and 2006, he led the prosecution of Slobodan Milosevic, former president of Serbia, at the UN's International Criminal, Tr Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. Since 2007, he has advised and represented at the International Criminal Court and elsewhere states, applicants, and victims concerning several internal and international armed conflicts. Sir Geoffrey was Gresham Professor of Law from 2012 to, to 2016. The floor is yours. I will speak briefly about the process, followed by Hamid Sabi, who will talk about the judgment. And with the chair's leave, we will then take some questions. The unlimited um, criminality and wickedness that man visits on man and woman in international, internal armed conflicts and in persecution of states by segments of their overall society, bringing about mass atrocities, uh, are always associated, or nearly always, with another real wrong, done not just by the states involved in, say, the killing, but other states, by international organizations like the United Nations, and material for this particular matter by professional bodies. And what is that wrong that they do? It is that they deprive those who have an interest of knowledge. They either lie directly about what has happened or they decline for reasons of political convenience ever to acknowledge the truth of what has happened. It suits them. This has meant over recent years, by which I mean 70 years or 60 years, from time to time, just occasionally, there have been events where the truth has not been told and where it has been appropriate for things called people's tribunals to fill a gap in knowledge left intentionally or negligently by bodies that should have done the job. For those of you not familiar with uh, people's tribunals, and there are many of them, the most famous in date order are probably the Comfort Women Tribunal that reported in 2000 into the sexual slavery of women in the service, as it were, of the Japanese military in World War II. That tribunal avoided the political niceties of General MacArthur and found the uh, emperor himself responsible for the suffering of those unhappy women. Following that, there was the origin of people's tribunals, the Lord Russell Tribunal into Vietnam. No one was going to, and nobody ever has, assessed on an evidence base the general criminality of America in that war. The Russell Tribunal was deeply flawed in many ways, but it set a pattern. The Indonesian Tribunal looked at the massacre of communists in 1965, a million or so. Nobody was ever going to investigate that, partly because they were communists and because the West was involved in what happened to them. The 1985 massacre uh, by the Ayatollahs of Iran of their opposition in prisons in particular was dealt with by another tribunal. Nobody's going to mess with Iran on such a limited matter as historical wickedness when there are so many other problems uh, afoot. So they serve a potential purpose of filling an, uh, an evidence gap, of filling a knowledge gap. And when I was a, perhaps I should just um, add this, great, 
if somebody could rewrite the 1948 Universal Declaration, but of course it wouldn't ever be possible nowadays, we know that, and add in one more right, the right to know. There's no state that would ever allow that right to be included. So sometimes it does fall for the ordinary citizen of the world to gather together and to answer a question that should be answered but has not been. And so when I was asked by uh, the NGO ETAC, which commissioned the creation of this tribunal, to write a legal opinion on the matter, were crimes committed, I said, well, that'll be a waste of time. Nobody will read it. It'll never make it as an op-ed in a newspaper. It won't even merit a dusty file in a government office. But have you thought about a people's tribunal? And they hadn't. And they didn't really think it was a very good idea at the time because a people's tribunal might challenge the certainties they already had. But they went away and they thought about it and eventually they came back and they said yes. And so we created a model of a tribunal different from the others, learning from them not based on lawyers, we didn't particularly want lawyers, we had a number on the tribunal but they didn't work as lawyers, not based on people with any commitment. Five out of seven members of the tribunal, I was one of them, knew absolutely nothing of this scandalous story when we started work on it. So we set up a tribunal of seven people as it happened and we worked on the basis that we would have evidence presented to us, which we did, evidence would be given live and in person, we had two evidential hearings, after the first hearing, we converted ourselves a little bit into a tribunal of inquiry. We, we wanted more evidence. We asked questions so that we could fill in what we may have considered to be gaps in the information coming towards us. We applied only the most basic uh, tenets of uh, fair procedure, because that's all you require. Proof beyond reasonable doubt if we were to say anything adverse about the People's Republic of China. Uh, hearing live witnesses wherever we could, treating other forms of evidence with much greater caution and not allowing expert witnesses to give final opinions on the very matters we were concerned with. That's about all you need for a reasonable determination of a difficult factual issue. And we then approached the evidence we got by putting it into silos or into little local universes of evidence concerning particular topics. There are a number of topics. Hamid, who will speak about these things, may tell you more. But we looked at topics of evidence, phone calls to hospitals, revealing what the hospitals were offering in the way of uh, organs for sale, for example. And then we said, not what does this evidence tell us about the People's Republic of China. We said, supposing that evidence related to New Zealand, Canada, People's Republic of, not People's Republic, the Republic of Ireland, countries with good human rights record, what would that evidence prove to us to the level of certainty? And that way we insulated ourselves from prejudice. We built up a, a sequence of decisions of, of which we were certain, always operating at the highest common factor or is it lowest common denominator, I never know which, among everybody, so that we were all certain of that which we agreed, put them together and reached our result. And that's probably all I really need to tell you about uh, the process, but it is a process that on occasions where issues are straightforward, and this is a straightforward issue, quite a lot of evidence, but it's a straightforward issue. This is a circumstance where citizens of the world, if they are disposed to give their time uh, and effort free, of course, to simply answering a question, can serve, it seems to us, and I hope it will seem to you, a useful purpose. We have remained, as a tribunal of seven, separate from the lobbying, the activist function. That's not for us. We are essentially like a jury in a criminal trial. We receive the evidence, we are told what the law is and therefore how to reach our verdict. And once we've delivered our verdict, or our judgment in this case, we disappear into the shadows. And it is for those who are committed to acting in respect of this problem them to do what they can and will with our judgment. And so it is that our judgment does show something to the level of certainty, proof beyond reasonable doubt about the People's Republic of China. But also, it may be that it shows in a world where we are deprived of truth for all sorts of reasons, by countries, international bodies, the citizen can sometimes fill the gap. Thank you.
Thank you, Sir Geoffrey Nice. Hamid Sabi is a London-based lawyer with an international practice in human rights, arbitration, and litigation. He acted as counsel and rapporteur to the <coughs> Iran Tribunal, which was an independent people's tribunal investigating mass killing of political prisoners by the Islamic Republic of Iran in the 1980s. We just add that Amit Sabi also just spoke at the Human Rights Council on the right of nine, uh, just before this event. Mr. Sabi, the floor is yours. Thank you. <coughs> Admitted to the tribunal. All of it is available on the website of chinatribunal.com if you would like to visit. First of all, the tribunal members were given a reading list including books, articles, videos, reports regarding forced organ harvesting in China. This run into thousands of pages and many hours of the video footage. Then over 50 witnesses gave evidence. 28 of them were fact witnesses and the rest were experts, reporters and investigators. These witnesses were heard in two sessions in December and April, December 2018 and April of this year. The witnesses provided details of various approaches that they had made, especially the investigators gave details of the telephone calls they had made to various hospitals, transplant hospitals across China, inquiring about availability of organs and appointment times. Also substantial evidence was given by experts regarding the sources of organ and the China organ donor system. In addition, the Council to the Tribunal <coughs> invited the Chinese government, the representative of People's Republic of China in London, to attend the hearings, as well invitations went out to doctors in China and also those who had supported China's position around the world to come and give evidence to the Tribunal. I'll discuss about this later. The tribunal considered that the main target of China's organ transplant system was and continues to be Falun Gong practitioners, a group involving millions of followers in China and elsewhere, practicing all Chinese exercises, a peaceful group advocating truthfulness, forbearance, and tolerance. <coughs> and Alice Fang is a member of that and a practitioner of the Falun Gong. From 99, 1999, the Communist Party of China has declared this group as outlaws. Millions were imprisoned and tortured. A special office called 610 Office was established with wide and extrajudicial power to root out Falun Gong. And those who gave evidence testified, like Ali Fang did here, as to the horrible times they had in, hospital, in the prisons, how they were tortured, and routinely they were taken to clinics nearby, or sometimes a bit far away, to test their organs, to, to, take, to draw a large amount of blood, and they were never given the result of this medical investigation. The tribunal also heard evidence from four Uyghur fact witnesses who gave evidence as to how they were tortured, and also subjected to blood test and organ testing. Also, the tribunal had the experts who testified about the situation of Uyghurs in China. China has created one of the largest transplant facilities in the world, with over 700 hospitals throughout China involved in transplantation of organs. The investigators had found that by making telephone calls to the hospitals and pretending to be doctors, needing organ for their patients or an authority from a communist party and questioned about availability of organs and the time to carry out an organ transplantation. Invariably, the hospitals had confirmed that organs were available, on demand, and appointment times that were given were between two to three weeks or mostly a month from the date of telephone call. There's no comparison between these figures and what you get in the Western world where <coughs> there are many ethical requirements for a transplantation, the consent of donor, the, the fact that the donor should be dead at the time that the, the organ is taken out, etc. It takes months and sometimes years 
for a suitable organ to become available in Western countries. China has already admitted that until 2010, the transplant industry was run by using organs from death row prisoners. So they have accepted, admitted, and can confirm that until 2010, when they executed the prison without their consent, they would take all their organs and then sell it to organ tourists across China. There was a lot of international outcry and a lot of pressure <coughs> on China. So they claim that as of 2010, they have made the organ transplantation subject to the <coughs> consent of the donors and set up an organization called Cohort, which is a Chinese, Chinese computerized organ donation system to collect data about organ donors and register them and then use the computer system for distributing the organs across China. China has provided very little evidence of how the system works and has refused to provide any evidence to the tribunal. The experts who had reviewed China's figures about registered donors and the organs that had been taken from them had found that none of these figures that provided by China can be genuine. For instance, in one day, 25,000 people were added to the list of donors. China says that, first of all, they say that they only carry out 10,000 to 14,000 transplant a year. This does not match the capacity of the hospitals they have or the figures that are published in different journals by Chinese doctors saying that how many transplants they have carried out. The investigators had estimated these figures to be on a conservative <coughs> basis between 60 to 90,000 transplant a year. This is at least six, seven times as much as China declares to be the official figure. Also, China had no previous registered donor system and organ donation is not culturally something that the Chinese are, are, would like to do. Nevertheless, China maintains that from this limited pool of organ donors, they can extract 10,000 organs a year, 10 to 14,000. The investigators had checked that this would create something around 2.7 organs from each donor that has passed away. The figure is 140 times the figure that in the Western world is used. So if somebody dies somewhere in Europe, they have to blood test him, make sure that he's near a transplant hospital, find somebody who is the correct recipient for that organ, transfer both of them in time to a place where within the three to four hours window, this transplantation can occur. And therefore, it is less than 1% chance that if somebody who is a registered donor passes away, that one organ from him can be used. China maintains that from every deceased registered donor, they extract 2.7 organs, which is almost an impossibility. There are many other supporting and corroborative evidence that points to the fact that China has a very serious pool of getting organs. How can you organize a heart transplant within two weeks from the date that a request for transplant is made and carry it out in order to get a heart or two kidneys or a whole liver from a donor there is no other way but that donor to be dead. How can in two weeks ahead of time you can fix that date and ensure that the DNA and the tissue samples and the blood samples would match the, the one that is requested for the recipient? There is no question that there is something very serious missing from this and the tribunal had come <coughs> to the conclusion that 
Uyghurs and Falun Gong, to a large extent Falun Gong and probably Uyghurs were subjected to organ harvesting in China for many years and many, many victims, perhaps hundreds of thousands of victims were involved in this practice. This is the reason why the tribunal considered China as a criminal state. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sabi. Let me now introduce Suzy Yu, Executive Director and co-founder of ETAC, the human rights charity that initiated the tribunal. Multiple reports from credible sources have detailed this issue as far back as 2006, with prominent investigations being released in 2014, 2016 and 2018. However, controversy as to whether forced organ harvesting from prisoners of conscience was truly happening persisted. This had been partly due to the readiness of some governments, international transplant organisations and leading medical bodies to accept the Chinese government's reform narrative, despite a continued lack of transparency that breaches the international standards promoted by these same organisations. When we first approached Sir Geoffrey for an independent legal opinion, and he recommended that the gravity of the allegations justified a People's Tribunal, there was no guarantee that the outcome would result in mass crimes being committed. For us, primarily a coalition of lawyers, academics, <coughs> medical professionals and researchers, it was worth what could be perceived as a risk. It was vitally important to progress the debate about whether China has been killing innocent people for their organs or not. The China Tribunal has made their judgment. The summary report is available for all to see, and soon the more detailed full report will be released. It is now time to act, for not doing so would amount to, as the Tribunal has stated, willful blindness. And for some who may be closer to what it, it's closer to what is going on, may in fact be complicit in these crimes. So what can and must be done? Recent developments and calls to action in the wake of the tribunal include a joint letter has been sent to the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, the UN Secretary General and UN Member States signed by 18 international organisations calling for a UN Commission of Inquiry into forced organ harvesting in China. Signing organisations include the Canadian Centre for Victims of Torture, Uyghur Human Rights Project, Australian Lawyers for Human Rights, Victims of Communi Communism Memorial Foundation, the Raoul Wallenberg Centre for Human Rights, Lawyers Watch Canada, and Decision Research USA. Prominent individuals such as Elizabeth Evatt AC, former member of the United Nations Human Rights Committee, <coughs> Professor Arthur Kaplan, founding head of the Division of Medical Ethics at NYU School of Medicine, and Professor Sevozdowski, former Australian Human Rights Commissioner, also signed. After viewing the China Tribunal report, the US Republican National Committee recently passed a resolution stating that they strongly condemn the practice of China's involuntary organ harvesting and that they consider China's involuntary organ harvesting as a major human rights violation. In the UK, the House of Lords are pressing for the World Health Organization to look closely at the China Tribunal's findings. The WHO, who had previously advised the UK Foreign Commonwealth Office that China's transplant practices were ethical, and who have possibly provided the same advice to other countries, has now acknowledged that the information they had based their advice on was based on the self-assessment made by the country that is the signatory, and in this case, that is China. This is a perfect example of a leading medical body accepting the Chinese government's reform narrative, despite obvious breaches of the WHO guiding principles on human cell, tissue and organ transplantation. Foreign officers around the world should also press the WHO to engage with the tribunal report and take urgent action, and global citizens should press their foreign officers to do so. Legislation needs to be put in place banning organ trafficking and transplant tourism. Laws now exist in Israel, Spain, Taiwan, Italy, Norway and Belgium. In the UK, a private member's bill to stop unethical organ tourism will be tabled in October. And in Canada, an organ trafficking bill recently received unanimous support from both the House of Commons and the Senate. A component for mandatory reporting is essential to ensure that transplant tourism is tracked. University and hospital part uh, partnerships with China in relation to transplant medicine research and training are also increasing. 
policy is urgently needed so that collaborations do not take place in relation to organ transplantation. Any institutions already collaborating should disassociate immediately. Chinese transplant surgeons should not be allowed to participate in international transplant conferences, nor should they be allowed to partake on decision-making groups who work with the Declaration of Istanbul Custodian Group, the Transplantation Society, or the WHO. And it may be noted that at this moment, they are involved in all three organisations. Resolutions should be passed by governments around the world condemning forced organ harvesting in China, urging both international bodies and the public to act. UN member states should abide by the legal obligations of the treaties they have signed, including under the Genocide Convention and the Convention Against Torture. They should uphold their obligations under the UN responsibility to protect, or they too should be held to account. These are only some of the actions that need to take place to prevent others from being entangled in China's elaborate murderous transplant scheme to protect those who are still at risk, to bring recognition, solace and hope to victims and members of the victimised and targeted groups, primarily those who practice the Buddhist school, spiritual practice of Falun Gong and Uyghur Muslims, and ultimately to bring justice to those whose lives have been lost. It is now up to all of us as individuals, corporations, international organisations, legislators and UN permanent missions to collectively enforce the China Tribunal's judgment to put an end to this horrendous abuse and the killing of innocents for their organs. <laughs>